The week after I released online ordering, our revenue tripled. And I was like, okay, well, this just got, this. I just like hit the easy button. It wasn't actually easy after that point, but it was easier. <laughs> Hey, Founder Fam, welcome back to another episode of the Founder Podcast. Today, we're speaking with Mike Evans, co founder and COO of Grubhub. Started initially as a hobby, Mike grew Grubhub into one of the largest food delivery companies in the United States. Now, his second company, Fixer, is solving a different kind of craving home repair. Today, we're going to go over the key foundations of what has really helped enable Mike's success and why people are at the center of what builds a great business, how he hires, how he attracts, how he retains talent. Please welcome to the Founder Podcast, Mike Evans. The first question that we ask everyone that comes on is, how did you get your job, aka how did you find yourself doing the work you're doing today? Yeah, so the job I've got today is I'm the founder of a company called Fixer.com, and it's an on-demand handy person company. So we go and do all sorts of things like hang TVs and patch holes in walls and things like that, and paint and, and a variety of things. And and the reason I got into this, uh, and and you can order order the service on demand or schedule it all through like a modern interface. And the reason I got into it was um, it's really hard to get work done on your home. And I was very annoyed by the fact that it was hard to get work done on your home. And I had done a startup previously. And so I had a lot of, I had friends, uh, former coworkers who I'd worked with. Um, I had run a business before. And so I thought, well, I'm going to do this a second time around. So that's how I got this job is I found a problem that I wanted to solve. And I had some background in doing this. And so I just did it. And maybe maybe to the spirit of the question, how I got how I went around about doing it the first time Actually, it was kind of similar. Um, I wanted a pizza and getting a pizza was hard. Um, you had to call on the phone, which is like this app that's on your phone that you never use, right? And so uh, the apps didn't even exist. The mobile phones were fairly new at the time I started Grubhub. And so um, they were all the flip phones, not smartphones. And so it was hard to order a pizza. And um, I started out making a website and then sold my first restaurant. Um, and then pretty quickly, quit my job and, and decided to starting a company. Uh, I didn't really know what I was doing, <laughs> sort of learned as I went along the way and uh, uh, was hoping to pay off some some debt from, from my college loans. I overshot, went all the way to an IPO, um, which was fun. Everyone should do it. <laughs> awesome. So let's go back to the early days Grubhub. Back when you were first starting the company, I think it you know you had like a $140 check to start it. What did the early years look like you know, what What did life look like? What kind of future did you see for yourself back then? Do you think it was going to be this yeah. massive company? Uh, I did not think it was going to be a massive company. And so, um, you know, I, I started as a hobby. So, you know, some some people go to go to a business school and they, they realize they want to become a CEO and they kind of train for that. And then they think of an idea and then they get some venture capital and they do it. That was not my story. I had a software degree uh, and I was a software developer. I, I just really wanted to, like a better way to order pizza and just to find the restaurants that delivered to my address uh, in downtown Chicago. And so I wrote as a hobby, I made a website. And so it was, there was a year gap between the first version of the website in 2002. And I kept tinkering with it. It started getting traffic. It showed up on Google at the time, MSN people still used and Lycos and Yahoo. Um, it wasn't all just Google. So I started showing up on all the search engines. And uh, and then at some point I was like, oh, I think I got something here. Like maybe I maybe this could be like a business. Maybe I could sell, I don't know, like advertising or something to restaurants. And then uh, Matt Maloney, the guy who ended up becoming my business partner later, um, he's he actually sold the first restaurant, $140 check. And I had that, I got that check and I was like, oh, this, I don't have to have a job anymore. I could just like hustle and get, like restaurants to sign up for advertising and that could be my job. And so I, within, um, within a couple of weeks, I quit with that $140 check. I had, I also cashed in, in the U S there's a, I had, I had like a retirement fund that I had, you know, I was only 26. So I just started putting into it. I cashed that out. I just cashed it in like for the cash paid all the penalties for early retirement and everything at 26. Right. And, uh, 
And I used that too, but that was like $10,000. It wasn't a huge amount of money. And what did the first version of the platform of Grubhub look like? Um, and how'd you put it together? So the first version was just something I wrote up in HTML. Like it was not, not real pretty. It was, um, it was a delivery guide. So you could just see all the restaurants that delivered to a particular postal code in Chicago. It, there was no online ordering. Uh, there were no menus. It was just a list of restaurants. That was like version 0.1 was just a list of restaurants that delivered only to my address. And if you if you went on the website and you happened to live next to me, it was really useful. But like it didn't have the whole city or anything. It was literally just my address. I, and I just called all the restaurants. So it would be my own personal sort of listing. So that was the very first version. Pretty quickly after that, I got more restaurants on board and and made it more valuable for the entire city of Chicago. And then, and then it was that it was that version that I sold an advertising package for, uh, which was just the top listing. That was all it was. Yep. So that was all the that was all sort of the first year, and then it it turned on its head when we started when when I started charging on a per order basis and 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 set up online ordering. That's when it really accelerated instead of just selling advertising packages. Interesting and like two sided marketplaces are some of the most difficult businesses to build. How did you go early days seeding supply and demand? Like, was that just extreme hustle? Like, were you working around the clock? Uh, talk us through that. Was it a, you know, 18 hour days, day on day, you and, Ma uh, you and Matt? I've been asked this question a bunch because I've been on board members for various marketplaces and I've, I've been around marketplaces now for like 20 years. And I have a very, like, very, I have an answer to this question. Cheat. You have to figure out how to cheat. You have to figure out something, some hook, some hack, some trick, some cheat, something so that you can invent value for one side of that marketplace before the other side is even on. And so in Grub, I'll give you an example because Grubhub is a good example of this. So in Grubhub's case, what I did is I went and, and picked up all of the, this is like in year two of the business. I went and picked up all of the physical menus for all the restaurants and I scanned them with a scanner and I put them online. So the diners, the people who are hungry, when they came to the website, there was value there before I signed up a single restaurant in terms of online ordering because they could see the menus for all the restaurants that they would order from. And I put it up, just did it for free for all restaurants in the city. Um, I literally just was on a bike and and got every menu in the entire city myself. And so that took a little bit of hustle, but it wasn't, it was like a couple of weeks. It wasn't that much work. Um, you know, I, you know, I probably rode a thousand miles, but like on my bike, but like it, it took a couple of weeks, but this idea that like you have to, for a two-sided marketplace where in, in Grubhub's case, the, in, the diners got value. The more restaurants we had on the site, the more valuable it was for the diners. And the more diners we had on the site, the more valuable it was for the restaurants. You have to start somewhere with this chicken and the egg. And so that's why I say cheat. Like you have to figure out some, some way to create value for one side, one side or the other of that marketplace without having to rely on, on customers who say yes to a sales process, right? So for me, it was picking up the menus. Um, in Uber's case, um, because they they launched shortly after Grubhub and, and I knew um, Travis a little bit because we had we both had Benchmark as an investor. They just hired drivers before there was anybody getting rides. So they hired the drivers and paid them for their time when they launched a city, right? Before they had any any drive anybody using the service, right? So most marketplaces you'll find invest or subsidize or cheat on one side of the model to get that flywheel started. And then once it once it gets going, it has a momentum of its own and it, growth, it grows on its own. Oh, what a great insight. Thank you for sharing. Publicly talked before around the power of having a co-founder. Um, I'd love to talk and explore that a little more. Um, just around your relationship with Matt, the power of having a co-founder, how did that look in the early stages of forming the business? Yeah, early on, it was, it was me for the first couple of years. Um, pretty much exclusively. And then Matt came on. Um, so I, I went full-time in 2004. Matt came on in 2006. And it was a big accelerator when he came on full-time because the problem with having to do with being responsible for every single aspect of the business yourself, the, the challenge with that is that there's some things that you're just naturally not good at. And the things that you're, or, or actually even worse, there's things that you don't enjoy. And the things that you don't enjoy get less attention than the things that you do enjoy. 
So the power of having a co-founder is that hopefully you don't like and dislike exactly the same things. And so, you know, Matt, like I was fine at marketing and I was fine at sales, but I was much better at technology and at customer service. And, and so Matt, Matt took that over when he came on board. And so it, it accelerated the business because we had people who were passionate about what they were doing in charge of the things that they were, they were passionate about. Um, I think that was a, that was a, probably the most powerful element in those early days of, of having a, uh, having when Matt came on as a, as a partner. And can you talk to us about the atmosphere in the early years, like how, like your life as a, as a founder in the early years of Grubhub and what that looked like, the atmosphere? Yeah. I mean, there's, um, I was fortunate to have a lot of time to be able to spend on the company. So I didn't have kids yet, you know, everybody in my family and in my sort of close social circle was healthy. And so because of that, I had the lux really the luxury and the privilege to be able to spend a lot of time on the business, which isn't true for everybody, right? Um, and so I should point out that the first year of the business, it was just a hobby. I did it sort of in the evenings on my free time when I wasn't playing Xbox. It's like, so like, it was not that much of a hustle to start. It was only after it had gotten a little bit of traction that I quit my job and did it uh, full time. And then once it was full time, it was probably like to start that first year full time, it was probably like 50 or 60 hours a week, maybe a little bit more. And so there was a lot of hustle. There's a lot of late nights, maybe 70 on some nights. It actually wasn't until um, my wife spent a year overseas that I was able to really commit like crazy hours to the business. And so there, there, I don't want I don't want to say, I don't know how to say this. There's a middle ground between work-life balance which which is where where you're just totally happy in every realm of your life which i think is actually a little unreasonable for most founders but there's a middle ground between that super happy place and sort of hustle porn which is like what a lot what a lot of people in this industry talk about where you just work like crazy right there's a middle ground where you can work quite hard but also are a little bit thoughtful about working smart um and you don't burn yourself out completely. And so, so it's it's something more than a normal job, but it, if it's it's not sustainable to work 70, 80 hours a week forever, right? You may have bursts of that. Um, and I think that that's important because if you internalize as a founder, if you internalize the idea that I can just work harder, th that's a limited resource. You, you only have so many hours that you can give. And whether it's twice as much as a normal human or not, it still caps out at some point. Mm. And and then the problem with internalizing that for yourself is then you start to expect that of other people. And so, um, you know, if you have like a software project and you want to have it done by, um, and you have a deadline of June, June 1st, um, if you miss that deadline, it's never the software developer's fault. It's always, you set this, you set the scope wrong or you didn't resource it correctly. It's always the manager's fault when a deadline is missed. It's never the person executing. Um, because if they're not correctly resourced and have the right, team and have the right goals, it doesn't make sense to hold them to some sort of arbitrary standard. And that all starts with this idea of like, if I just hustle more, then I can, I can make it work because you can't really expect that of employees either. So I think it's important to set that, establish that mentality early of hard work is fine up to a point. And so what were the challenges in the early days? What were some of the biggest challenges? Sales, was, I didn't know how to do sales. That was a big challenge. Uh, I didn't know the first thing about how to sign a restaurant up. And so there was, um, there was a lot of pain involved in learning how to sell, uh, sell small businesses. That was, I mean, that was the biggest challenge by far. And, you know, I, I got books, I got a mentor. I, I just kept hammering at it. I ended up getting decent at it, but in the end, the end, what what ended up working best was actually moving away from that challenge. So the original product was we were selling a subscription model for advertising, X hundred dollars per month. And we moved to selling per order. And once we moved to selling per order, then it became an issue of I didn't have to double my revenue in the in the first version of the website, to double the revenue of the business, I had to double the number of restaurants that were signed up. In the second version of the business, to double my revenue, I had to double the number of people who were ordering. And the second problem is a much more, it, I think it's a much easier problem to solve because you can, you can do SEM and SEO and all sorts of different advertising things. And you get loyalty from customers who then reorder and all sorts of things that I just found were much easier than signing up restaurants. 
And so that was probably the biggest challenge was the sales and then how that ultimately led to an evolution of what the business model was. Got you. And then so when you when you change the business model, that's when things started to rapidly grow. That's when you look to raise money, et cetera, et cetera, right? Yeah. So I I started in 2002. We didn't raise financing until 2007. And so the first five years, it was just uh, it was just growth growth on revenue. The big accelerator was when we when we released online ordering for sure. About three years in, it was kind of astonishing at the time. And I wrote this. I obviously I just wrote this book, Hangry, about this. And there's a moment in the book where I literally say like face palm, and I don't just say it. I literally smacked myself in the head when I realized that people would probably prefer online ordering to calling on the phone. Um, and I and I burned like three years working on this like delivery guide with a phone system that could track orders and all this stuff. And I was like, why didn't I just start with online ordering? This is so much better. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the big accelerator. My, the week after I released online ordering, our revenue tripled. And I was like, okay, well, this just got this. I just like hit the easy button. It wasn't actually easy after that point, but it was easier. <laughs> yeah. And I want to talk about your book, Hangry. In it, you also talk about this idea of greed and how as you get more and more success, you have to watch out for your greed. Um, can you talk us through that a little more and, and maybe some potential mistakes that you made? You know, the, the greed comes from a couple different places um, as a business gets successful. So before a business is very successful, you might have people who have grand ideas about wealth and that that's fine. Everybody puts it to the side and they worry about building a product that works for customers because that's the path to it. The, I think one of the challenges of becoming quite successful is that it's easy to forget that generating profit is not the primary reason businesses exist. And that sounds like blasphemy from a, from a capitalism perspective. The primary thing that businesses do is they create value for customers. Coincidentally, they happen to make money from that. And the companies that forget that their reason for existence is to bring value to customers, and they start to think that the reason to exist is to create shareholder return, um, ultimately end up having terrible products for their customers. It might take decades for it to devolve to that point. But um, the North Star for any well-run company is, are we developing value for our customers? And I think one of the things that can happen as a startup goes from, oh, we have this idea that's pretty valuable for some people to, oh my goodness, we're a national or international phenomenon, is it's it's easy to forget that the cost, the, the value has to go and keep going to customers. Because for individuals in that in that system, the the founders, the early employees, the early investors, the amount of just the sheer amount of wealth that can be created from changing if you change the way a million people do something in just a slight way and you make a little bit of a profit from it you will become crazy rich right like that's one of the things that happens in startups um and so it's so easy to forget that that was not the point like that that's not what got you there what got you there was the change in behavior and the value that you created and so that was tr that's true for every person in a startup it's true for early employees it's true for the, the the founders, certainly, it's true for the investors. Um, and I think that there's sort of two ways to be on guard for that, or, or two ways to react, two ways to prevent greed and the, des the, the desire for wealth from overriding um, really the, the everything in a company. And the first one is to keep focused on customers and creating value. And the second piece is um, philanthropy. You just have to start giving money away very quickly. Um, it's it's as far as I can tell from like a personal acquisition of wealth perspective, the only defense against becoming a rich asshole is to start giving money away quickly. There's no substitute for it. You just have to start being um, donating. Uh, and it doesn't even have to be much, but it has to be an, a very quick response um, because it can be very wealth can very easily change a person, not for the better. Um, there's a lot of pressure to start to see it as it's mine and it's. I earned it and I get to hold on to it and nobody helped me get here and I did it all myself. And none of those things are true. We, we all rely on the infrastructure and the people around us to be successful. And so, um, I don't know, I think that philanthropy is a really good way to counter that really negative um, 
thing that's easy to believe that 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 I did it all myself, that I'm the hero. Yeah, I love this philosophy. Um, so what compelled you to write the book, Hangry, and why now? So I wrote the book because um, the experience that I had uh, starting, starting a company in my apartment, um, being thoughtful about it for sure, running it all the way through the IPO, I think it just didn't fit like a lot of what business schools sort of preach is what happens for entrepreneurs. Like it took 12 years. It didn't take three, right? It, I didn't start with investors. I didn't go to, to MBA. And I, and I think that there's, um, I think that the, the message in the book, which was the thing that I experienced of having a goal and being thoughtful about it and not letting other people tell me what my goal should be. And then actually, like, and then actually going and working towards it is it is I think a thing that resonates with a lot of people today. Like the idea that you go and work at a company for 20 years and then, or 30 years and then retire there is not something that a lot of people like these days. I think a lot of people, certainly anyone in early or in the middle of their careers, you know, they, they look around, they're like, why am I working so hard for somebody else to benefit? And I think if you feel that way, it's a valid feeling. You, you, I think it's a totally reasonable thing to feel and to, to say, you know, maybe I could do something different. Maybe I could, whether it's do a startup or open a cafe or, or, or whatever. Um, I, I think being goal oriented about that and then, and then trusting your gut and going for it. I think that that's a, it's a totally legitimate set of life choices. And so I wrote the book to sort of encourage that. The, 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 one, the main theme of the book is be intentional about your goals. You know, when I started Grubhub, I wanted to pay off my school debts. And then it became a much bigger thing. And my goals changed as it got bigger. And then there's a secondary piece to that, which is quitting is okay. Like, and what I mean when I say that is if you've decided you have a goal for your life or for your career, or if I've decided that, and this is, this is what happened, this is what I explore in the book. And then the effort, the effort that you're putting towards that goal, it's somehow not hitting. Either it's not working, like you're not actually getting any closer to achieving that goal, or your goal has changed. Stop doing the effort. Stop doing the work towards the not the goal, not the goal. And so I talk about that a little bit about how entrepreneurs need to be good at quitting things when either their goals change or it becomes apparent they're not going to reach them to set new goals and to and to change their activity. Yeah. And can you tell us, you, you talk about uh, quitting. Can you tell us the difference between quitting and giving up? Yes, I certainly can, because that's what I wrote about in the book. Uh, there's a difference between I, I can objectively say that this goal is not to be, can't be reached, or similarly, that I have a different goal than what I started out with. And that's what I call quitting. And what I call giving up is um, my goal hasn't changed. And it looks like I can still get there if I just apply myself and my resources and my energy, but I really just don't feel like doing it. That's giving up. And I think people assume the stigma associated with giving up, which is, I just sort of ran out of steam for changing goals and, and just deciding, you know, this thing isn't working anymore and I need to, I need to do something different. And there should be no stigma associated with this idea of quitting something that's not working for you. Um, in the same way that there's stigma associated with just sort of like not really wanting to put in the effort. Yeah, um, this is really interesting. I'd love to explore this a little deeper because I thought like from my take, I thought that when, when somebody's quitting or giving up, um, effectively it's a mindset thing. I wouldn't think that people would be going, you know what, I, ca I believe I can do this or I believe it's achievable, but I'm going to give up. I would think it's more of a mindset thing, right? And if you never, if you never give up, you can always find a way, right? I think that one of the things that founders suffer from is just like humanity suffers from is an inability to have sunk cost thinking. The idea that because I've put two years of effort towards something, I should continue to put another two years of effort towards it. When sometimes the answer is I need to put effort towards a different direction. So the idea that you never give up on the uh, on yourself in terms of trying to be successful or trying different things to see what works is different like if that if that that is a goal that i that i think lines up with what you said about mindset where um giving yourself permission to try different things to get to success which might look different and it might look different as you evolve um that i think that that sort of um i think that's tenacity i think that that's totally reasonable yeah, I mean it's a little it's a little bit nuanced, right? Uh, but but yeah, I, I think um, 
I think a sort of a, I'm going to break down barriers and make this thing work attitude is helpful up to a point. Uh, and that point is, okay, maybe this isn't actually going to work and I need to try something different. Um, love to talk about burnout. Did you ever experience burnout? How close did you come to giving up with Grubhub? You know, if I, if you think of burnout as, as I just don't have the stamina to continue putting the effort towards this thing that I'm trying to accomplish because my, my life is out of balance, right? Like I don't have the relationships or I don't have, I'm not getting the sleep I need, or I don't have the recreation that I need and everything's going to work. Um, I think burnout can happen very easily in that situation, especially if you take the mentality that I'm just going to suffer now, but I can be rich and ha happy later. That does not work. That that hasn't worked for just about any founder. Um, you have to find some happiness in the moment. And so for me, I didn't I didn't really approach burnout um, because I was trying to find happiness and satisfaction and fulfillment in the moment as I was trying to build the thing with varied success at times. You know, when I and ultimately ended up leaving leaving Grubhub, you know, I certainly was was tired at that point. But the primary reason I left was because um, there was no there was no continuing to stay on after the IPO didn't align with anything that I wanted to accomplish, and so I didn't really have a reason to stick around. And so that wasn't burnout so much as what I talk about in the book. I I quit because my goals had changed. I've certainly come close a few times. The closest I've ever come to burnout is actually wasn't at Grubhub. It's it's it was during the pandemic. Right. Like I, I created Fixer, which is a business where we go into people's homes to fix things at a time when everyone stopped letting anyone come into their homes. And so our revenue dropped by 80% in, in April of 2021, uh, 2020. And, uh, and that next year, just like every, every three days being like, okay, well now there's some new guidance on how we handle this. And like, this testing and those masks and all, and it was just, it was just really hard to stay up with the chain atmosphere. The, we had to, you know, we, we decided to keep paying our workers, even though we didn't have a lot of revenue coming in. So we didn't decrease anybody's pay, uh, any of the fixers pay, any of the handy people's pay they're full-time employees. They're not contractors. And it was just, it was hard. It was hard to kind of sort of keep everyone happy, figure out, like we kept pivoting. We kept trying, we tried video consults. We tried larger jobs as a like general contract. We tried all this different stuff and it was just exhausting to be on this hamster wheel of pivoting every three months, trying to find something that would work in the pandemic before finally it just started getting back to normal-ish. Uh, and then in the last six months, really the last year really took off as things got back much more to normal in the US. And that was hard because my goals didn't change. I was still committed to, to, to solving them. I was trying to have work-life balance, but the externalities were so stressful that, um, you know, you just, you just sort of, you're sort of spending like from this reserve bank that's just empty at some point. And that's when, that's when burnout happens. I'd love to talk about Fixer um, offline before we hit record. Uh, you were sharing something really interesting about this idea of, you know, after you're doing it a second time, you forget how hard it is to actually start something and get traction. Can you tell us more about that and, and how Fixer came about? Uh, it came about because I had had I'd taken a few years off of after the IPO Crow Hub, and um, I was starting to think that maybe I could do a second round, like some sort of some sort of second time around uh, on a new business. And a combination of two things happened. One was I got annoyed because I couldn't find somebody to come do work on my house for like a small two, three hour job related to I was doing something with some gutters and um, I just couldn't get somebody to show up. Like there just wasn't nobody, I couldn't, I couldn't find anybody to actually show up. And I was frustrated by that and starting to think like, why, like, why, why is it so hard to get, get somebody to show up? And at the same time, I had been doing a lot of, I putting a lot of energy and in, in, into the concept of impact investing, which takes the idea of, can you have a business where the, the benefit you provide for customers and, and the social benefit you create for the community in which you operate? can't be divorced, that the two go hand in hand. And ultimately what we found, what we, what we hit on was the reason it's so hard to get a handy person in the US is because there are not enough tradespeople and all the trade schools have closed. And so there's no new tradespeople being trained. And so we thought, well, what if we train people from scratch, retain them as full-time employees with benefits? And um, instead of doing a two-sided marketplace, we just have a set of employees who actually do the work. Um, and so I got really excited about that idea, got the gang back together, the same team, 
um, got some of the same investors that I had previously, which was way easier than the first time I did Pine Hensing. That part with getting money was easy the second time around at first. Um, it's been harder since the pandemic. But, um, and so that's how I started it. And then I remember it, we all got together for the first day. We had like a co-working space and we all sat in a conference room. It was like 9 a.m. There's four of us. We had, I, I had not had a job since Grubhub. The other three people had quit their jobs. And we're like, how do we do this? Like, what do we do? Like, what, how do we start a business? Like, what do we do here? Like, and I had forgotten just how lost you can feel and how hard it is to create something from nothing. And so we literally split it up. We're like, okay, Zach is going to create a website to attract customers. Mike is going to go find customers. Josh is going to go find some people who can fix some things. And we'll all come back together at the end of the day and see if we have some jobs, have, if we've done some jobs. And it turns out we did. They took us, we had like five or six jobs that first week just from posting on Craigslist and hustling and things like that. And then it, and then it became over the course of the next year, it became much more like a, uh, had a lot more patterns that looked like a normal business. But you're just painting on a blank canvas when you start. And it's hard. It's really hard. It's, it's both a creative exercise. It requires a lot of discipline. It requires a lot of effort. It requires a lot of expertise. And there's no guarantee it's going to work. So, I mean, that all of that sums up to it's pretty damn hard. I got a few questions around kind of leadership teams and mindset. Um, how did you develop as a leader in the early days um, through explosive growth through Grubhub? Yeah, uh, quickly. I had to. I had to. Had to develop quickly. Uh, so I had a couple of tools. I, I had a couple of things that helped. I had a mentor, Chuck Templeton. He um, was the founder of Open Table, and so he helped a lot. Um, he really was a big proponent of just go put in a lot of FaceTime. Don't hide behind your computer. Really early on, I realized I wanted. You spend so much of your day at work that I wanted to have real relationships with the people that I was with. And I wanted everyone to not, not for it to be fun. Like we're all playing video games all the time, but for it to be fulfilling and enjoyable during the time that they were there, as opposed to they're just deferring having a good time so that they can get a big payout from the startup. Right. And so it took a lot of listening. Um, it, it took a lot for me to realize that asking for feedback and, and really encouraging people to tell you how they're feeling and what they're doing. And then not getting offended when they tell you that you need to change change your actions. Um, that was a big development point for me. Like, it's really easy when everybody's like, you know what's terrible? This office. And like, it comes through as like complaining. And then like being like, oh, maybe this office is terrible. Maybe I should do something about that, right? And so the, it just, it took a lot. And then I think one of the key moments, key lessons that I learned was um, in startup culture, there's a phrase that gets said often, which is hire slow, fire fast. And that the idea behind that phrase is that you want to take a really long time finding exactly the right people, but if they're not working out for the team, don't hang on to them for a long time. And I utterly reject that notion. I think it's a terrible idea. Don't think that you can be good at firing people and be a good leader because you have to have empathy for the people that you work with. And, and you're messing with people's livelihoods. I, I think pretty early on rejecting that idea that, that um, employees are disposable or that you get rid of people when they're not working out really quickly. Like I think you give people a lot of chances and and really try and develop people instead of a, sort of a toxic attitude of just let people go when it's not working out. And what about the startup mindset um, in the early days? How do you think entrepreneurs can evolve from that startup mindset when it comes to putting fully trust in their teams and letting go of that mindset that you have to do everything in that generalist approach and hustle and yeah. So when you start on your first day, most, most entrepreneurs own 100% of the company and do 100% of the work. And then from day two on is an exercise in decreasing that percentage from 100% to something closer to zero. You're constantly letting go. You're letting go of the ownership of the company. You're letting go of board position, like board seats. You're letting go of total control on the investment and ownership side. And then on the employee side, when you give somebody a job to do, it is far better to set a goal for someone and then say, this is what we need to have accomplished. Let me know how you're going to do it than it is to micromanage. And uh, it, ta it takes practice. It takes a lot of practice and letting go, setting goals, being clear, and then not micro, like standing back and trusting people. You need to really empower employees and trust them and give them autonomy 
Uh, by the way, it, that actually made the transition to a remote workforce a lot easier at Fixer because we already all trusted each other and we already ha all had a lot of autonomy. So like doing work remotely was, is kind of like, yeah, okay. It's, it's not that different. It kind of stinks. We can't see face to face, but there's no, like, there was no command and control issue related to that. And so I think like a, a an open-handed, highly autonomous, highly empowering, highly trustful approach is the way to go. The way, the only, the only way you get there is by practicing it, by practicing, giving up control, by practicing, letting, letting go. And then where you end up. So if, if the, if on day one, you, you do hundred percent of the work, you know, on, on, on day, whatever, five years in, ideally you're doing none of the actual work. And what instead you're doing is asking yourself the question every day, do we have the right people? Are they working on the right things? And do the people that we have have the right resources? That's that's my whole job now. I don't I don't write code anymore. I don't do advertising. I just keep asking that question every day. And so that it just takes practice to get from point A to point B. And when it comes to kind of having a successful IPO, what advice would you give to entrepreneurs that you know are looking for a successful IPO? I think it's really important to have a, an advisor or a mentor who's been through it before, whether that's a lawyer or another startup person, because all of the other players involved, the investors, lawyers, accountants, investment banks, regulators, everyone else has done this a hundred times and it's your first rodeo. And, uh, and that group of people, it is their job to optimize the outcome for themselves and for their clients. And so you don't want to go into an environment that everyone is sort of looking out for themselves and everyone else has more experience than you. And so I would just recommend that people talk to someone who's done it before. And what have you learned about yourself as a founder since building Fixer? I've learned that I was right about having empathy and trusting people is the right way to run a business. It is a lot less work than the first time around in that regard. It is still hard work and the pandemic certainly threw a wrench in things. There's this idea that like, you don't need to be the smartest person in the room. Like let other people shine. You know, when, when, the, when the business does well, that's all of your, that's all of your coworkers. It's because of them. And when it goes wrong, it's my fault. So like share the praise and accept the blame. Um, I, I just learned that I, I, it's re doing it a second time around has reinforced the importance of that's, that's the primary thing in terms of coworkers. I think the other thing that I've learned is um, however much you think the product for the customer is the most important thing, you're wrong. You don't think it enough. Like no matter how much you believe that's true, you could believe it even more that the customer, the product that, that creates value for the customer is the reason that your business exists. All the other stuff is window dressing. Awesome. Um, one last question, then we're going to move to the hot seat round. I could talk to you all day, Mike. This is awesome. For any entrepreneurs that are on the cusp of starting their first venture, what advice or what, would, what, what can they expect? What advice would you give them? Start. Start right now. Um, and what I mean by start is as rapidly as possible, get a product and sell it to a customer. Don't talk to people about what they might buy, what they would buy. Um, and don't spend a year and a half writing software and building a product. Get something as, as small and as, as core and as focused as possible. That's, that's your idea and get a customer to actually pay for it. That is starting and do it as quickly as possible. Unless you're building, um, you know, hardware in that, that like that you have to design from, from scratch or something like that. Like most software businesses can do this pretty quickly. Most businesses can do this pretty quickly, get value to customers as quickly as possible. Uh, and so that, that's my, that's my advice It's just start. We're going to move to the hot seat round now, rapid fire questions and answers. Uh, my first one is if you could go back to your first day in business and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be and why? Don't do takeout. Just do delivery. Pickup is a waste of time. Like people use Grubhub to order food at home. What's the most valuable skill for an entrepreneur to harness? Uh, empathy. Empathy for other humans. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? The best piece of advice that I was given was when Chuck told me, Chuck Templeton, who is the founder of OpenTable, he told me, take investment if you, because you want to learn, not because you want the cash, because it will really stretch you as a person. What's the worst advice you've ever been given? Hire slow, fire fast. I the like you should not be good at firing people. Nobody should be good at firing people. What's something you've learned today? 
I learned that my my daughter does a lot better when when I listen. Our relationship goes a lot better when I listen to her. All right, last question. If you could have dinner with any entrepreneur, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I'm kind of fascinated with like Dale Carnegie or or Stanford or any of those individuals who like created a whole university and changed the the path of of a ton of people. I'd be super interested in hearing their thought process behind that and like like what it was like in their society at the time. I don't know if they're great individuals or or they're problematic in certain ways or whatever, but like the you know the people who really are sort of were so philanthropic that they have whole things named after them. I kind of wonder, I would love to know what their imp- their impulses were, What like what was driving them. Awesome. Well, look, Mike, we'll wrap there, but thank you so much for your time. Last question. If anybody would like to know about your new book, Hangry, where's the best place people can go? So the the best way to get uh, a copy of Hangry is to go on Amazon or Aud- Audible for either the, uh, the hardcover or audiobook or Barnes & Noble, or go to IndieBound and see your local bookstore. Or if you just want to find more out, out more about the book, you can go to MikeEvans.com. All right. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mike. It was an absolute pleasure. Uh, Like I said, I could speak to you all day. You were very humble, very giving. And uh, yeah, looking forward to continuing to watch your success with Fixer and what you're up to next. Uh, Thanks. I appreciate it. uh, And I appreciate you getting up so early. uh, (laughs) uh, I've been to Melbourne a few times. I love it. It's actually like very similar to Chicago, but a little bit hilly. So um, yeah, I, I love I love uh, being down there. So thank you so t- for taking the time, getting up so early. You're welcome. Well, if you're ever in town, feel free to reach out. We'd love to uh, catch up further and connect. But uh, yeah, thank you again, and uh, we'll be sure to uh, share this with our audience. And uh, yeah, um, really appreciate all your help and advice, and just giving back to our community. All right, thank you. Thanks for having me. Hey, Founder Fam, did you love this interview? Well, if you did, then make sure to subscribe. We're dropping new interviews every single week and we can't wait for you to join the journey. All right, we'll see you soon.